hello friend here's a common problem these days gate posts that just don't last that if they don't rot off at the bottom they often go all down the center where the tantalizing process doesn't reach and although the chemicals are much less brutal these days it means they just don't last hardly any time there's three key things to making gate posts that last let's make some and i'll show you what they are The first and in some senses most obvious factor affecting longevity of posts is the material they're made out of. Now in many ways this choice will be determined by where you live, the environmental conditions in your part of the world. What we have available is this honking great log of Welsh oak. We'll talk through some of the other materials and methods as we go along, but for now I want to establish a straight cut on this log and mill some 8 foot lengths. Oak, according to my handbook of hardwoods, is considered durable as a material, meaning it survives 20 years in the ground. So I'm just using my spacer block things to mark out this beams, what will be gatepost beams. And don't forget your little room for the chain. You can have three 8x8 eight eight gateposts and two 7x9s. We'll see what it actually turns out like, but this is kind of like the rough plan. As we're getting a little bit of sap down the bottom in the corner here. I'm not too worried about just a tiny bit for the gateposts. We can always hack it off if need be. Like a lot of woods that are considered durable, the sapwood of oak is still very attractive to insects and bugs and is just much less durable. In the process of chainsaw milling, we'll be removing the sapwood and the bark leaving nice solid heartwood. The reason for removing the bark just from one side of the log is that that side gets pulled all the way through the cut by the chain and removing it limits the potential damage any bits of sand or dirt on the bark will do so essentially your chain stays sharper a bit longer. In fact, if you're using any kind of wood, and I'll talk through the pros and cons of other materials, you probably want the bark to be removed as this is where the majority of the bugs will kind of get a foothold, uh, a first sort of beachhead for their attack on the inner post. So, nine inches. A super popular choice for posts of all kinds in all different parts of the world really is pressure treated or tantalized timber. It has a customary green tinge to it and you heard me rubbishing it at the beginning of this video. So the logs on quite a big slope which is excellent for chainsaw milling because you don't put any effort in it just glides along itself the chain but we really don't want this giant slab slipping down into the river when we do the next bit. So I'm just putting some screws in here and that should hopefully hold it quite sturdily. To create some 90 degree edges on this massive slab we're using the same ladder we used earlier with this exceptionally crude contraption you can see bolted to the chainsaw guide bar. It's literally just a piece of round bar with two guides bolted to it and a spacer between that runs along the ladder. This is the first time I've used it and it actually worked quite well. I did discover that the rails of the ladder don't run perfectly parallel down its length which led to some binding shenanigans with that mill attachment but apart from that it worked quite well. Anyway, let's not get distracted. Why else might you choose a wood like oak, cedar, black locust, osage orange, or any number of other durable woods over some industrially pressure treated pine or spruce? Well, it is cheap, yes, but it just doesn't really last. So unless you really enjoy replacing gate posts and fence Great. posts, it's just not worth it. Some of them don't even last five years. By law in a lot of places in the world, pressure treating chemicals can't contain arsenic anymore as companies have scrambled to create effective alternative chemical recipes and in the most part failing. There's a lot of variance between what's in the pressure treating chemicals these days which is why you see variance amongst how long the posts actually last. The environmental impact of some of these mixes is not really well known, at least not long term. Here we go. Oh yeah. 
That works a treat. I have a friend who uses pressure treated posts and he feels that he's forced to put creosote on the bottom of them to allow them to last any length of time. Creosote though is becoming very difficult to get hold of and there's very good reason for that and that's because it's considered carcinogenic. Another thing that you wouldn't necessarily want to proliferate in the environment. Okay, I don't want to make it sound like what we're doing is easy here or possible for everyone. If you watch the video carefully, hopefully you'll get the sense that this actually takes quite a long time. For example, that's two posts, a few other bits and bobs and some slabs and that was a whole thing. The sun thing. was so strong yesterday you can already see the difference in colour between this side here and this one where the, the sun was covered with that block you saw earlier. So it's quite interesting. The medulla rays on this are amazing. It's a shame to be using it as a gatepost, but needs must. I know what you're thinking. Flowering elbow, what about metal and concrete gateposts? Well, longevity wise, they can actually be a good option. If you are the one who installs them, it's unlikely you're gonna be the one to have to replace them. In other words, they'll last a lifetime. My primary bias against them is cost, both in terms of dollar and environmentally. Unlike oak or chestnut or cedar, they neither grow locally or on trees at all. On top of that, they can be a bit fiddlier to install. The holes for hardware or the fence being precast or drilled into the post, so there's that to consider as well. Having said all that, as an off the peg solution, if you don't have any wood like this on your property and you don't want to be replacing posts every five to ten years, it might well be a better option than pressure treated posts. Plastic posts. Plastic's becoming more popular these days for posts, uh, probably purely to prove just how short term humans as species can think. Uh, let me sum it up by saying flimsy, junk, lightweight, probably quite convenient for exceptionally short term. UV damage is a problem for them. Phew, send shivers down my spine. Let's talk about moving heavy solid things. And tempo. Here's an example. When moving really massive things, it's amazing what you can actually shift when you coordinate max effort. Just think of the fishermen hauling in a net. It's sometimes much more about tempo than strength. For example, I could never lift Sam above my head just like that unless we perfectly time our tempo. Anyway, this is probably a slight distraction. We've talked about material and its importance. We've got a bunch of heartwood oak posts. Let's fly on to the second key thing we need to consider to increase their durability. This is all to do with how you treat your posts before you shove them in the ground. This goes together with part one in a sense in that depending on what you choose will change the way you treat them. If you choose a softwood like spruce that's just not durable at all naturally, you're essentially going to have to drench them and use high pressure to push the toxic chemicals in them if you want them to last any time. Lots of dubious things have been tried with them, plastic sleeves, bitumen, creosote, all that kind of thing. Some treatments have stood the test of time. Here we're using fire. Call it shosugiban, sugar soggy bun, or anything else you want, charring. It's a process that seems to have developed throughout history in parallel in multiple cultures, and it's still used today to great effect. There are a number of benefits and I'll go through them in turn. Let me just say a thing about our setup here though. We're using the rocket stove and this ladder. This was our first go at doing it 
and we soon decided the ladder was not the best solution. We couldn't rotate the beams inside the rungs of the ladder and this kind of shenanigans kept on happening too. So we improved upon that with my dad's scaffolding tower which we ended up actually fitting a roller to that was from an old treadmill and it just fit absolutely perfectly in the rungs there. It made it relatively effortless to move the beams back and forth over the flame. The question inevitably rises how much or how deeply should you char the posts? The answer seemed to vary between about 2 and 5 millimeters, depending on lots of factors like the wood species and all the rest of it. And if you understand the benefits, perhaps that gives you some clue. As the flame drives away moisture, it's also killing fungus and bugs that might reside in the wood but that's by no means the only benefit. Back her up! The volatile organic compounds are burnt away too, leaving just this inert layer of charcoal, which is probably quite unappealing to further insects and fungus. But between the outer layer of char and that unaltered wood inside, is a layer of torrified wood which has a much reduced potential for decomposition. This is the Paleolithic sharpened spear type effect where they found they could get a much harder, more durable point using this torrified layer that's super desiccated and just slightly altered kind of wood. There's two important points here. One, never try burning pressure treated wood, that'll give off horrible fumes. And two, the process doesn't seem to work well with softwoods. The very outside layer of charcoal can be scraped away, or at least in our experimental rendition of this, this is what we're doing. The theory behind that is that outer layer of charcoal can kind of trap and hold moisture, acting a little bit like a sponge. The rocket stove worked great for this. It was getting dark though and the few patchy bits that we didn't char as deeply as we liked were just hitting with the propane torch and we sure are glad that we used the rocket stove because that's a lot slower. In our little mini experiment here we're charring three of the six new gate posts and we'll report back in 20 years or so. We've talked about the material and the preservative treatment of posts. Let's move on to the third key thing when it comes to durability. That is, the way the post is installed in the ground. We know all too well where posts rot off and it's at that interface between the ground and the air where the topsoil provides the perfect environment for decomposition. We want a couple of big flat stones right at the bottom and so we need to make the hole big enough for that. That's twisted awkwardly so I'll get in and twist it round. <laughs> We want to do everything humanly possible to avoid the contact with that organic rotting matter. A big stone or a few big stones at the bottom of the hole provides excellent drainage and bears the weight of the post. And then once we have the post jiggled around and nicely leveled and wedged in place, we want to pack round it with about fist sized stones, again so that the post itself isn't touching any of the surrounding soil. So that needs to be bared in mind when digging the hole. Once you get compacting stones, it's surprising how far they don't go. And you actually need a lot of stones to fill around a post. So that's why you don't want the hole too much bigger or wider than the post itself. You can get rid of old crockery and other junk you have to. After plenty of hydraulic fettling and fixer-uppery, we've got the old JCB going now. Uh, that'll probably be a subject of a different video, but anyway, it's extremely useful in terms of digging the holes and delivering stones. When you get to the top, here comes the tricky bit as you try and arrange flat, long, big stones to cast the water away from the hole. It's kind of like slates on a roof. <laughs> Does feel quite sturdy. Ideally these big stones right at the top should also be preventing plant growth and all other organics rubbing on the gatepost and imparting moisture and bugs and other stuff and again should prevent decay a little bit. Because tannins in oak react very strongly with steel we're just putting a slip of plastic, in this case a yogurt pot, between the post and the receiving latch and that just prevents the black staining you see and the corrosion. 
this area is actually a joining of three different fields and so we've got two other gate posts we need to replace this one here is one that hangs that gate you can see in the top left and in the middle you can see the big lump of concrete and there's other bits of concrete in there they're from a once removed gate post most people think of concrete as quite a poor solution for putting timber posts in in terms of durability although it is exceptionally rigid to begin with. My own dad put that post in so it can't have been that long since that one went there's been a whole other pressure treated post that was just rammed in quite shallowly in that same location. Hopefully this oak post will be there a little bit longer. This is how we're compacting the stones and ramming them into place. The idea is that you do a few inches of extra stone and then you ram that all home, do another layer, ram that down, do another layer, compact it back down. And that way by the time you get to the top you've got an absolutely rock solid post. Here we're drilling for the top hook of the gate that will be under tension when it's mounted. Uh, it's quite something to drill such a big hole through so all the way through such a large post. The bottom one of course is just rammed home and that's got to be very tight because it's under compression from the gate. After a little gate test fit we can work out the position of the other hole and that was quite an interesting one to dig just because it was so close to that trough there and I'm still very much on the steep part of the learning curve with this JCB. We made this receiving gate post not one of the char treated ones and installed in exactly the same way with the same compacting, top stones, all the rest of it. It should be really fascinating to see how it compares in longevity to the other two. Probably isn't necessary in oak, but to stop the droppings and other things rotting the top and water in general, we're just going to add a little hat. Closing gates have never been so satisfying. Well friends, hope you enjoyed that and got something useful. I bet you've got different ways that you do gate posts or any posts and if so let us know what they are in the comments and share that. If you haven't then do something in the comments anyway. Uh, bye from Sam and I. See you next time. Subscribe! We ha! <laughs>